Hello, Hi. everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our special guest is widely considered to be the king of comedy. He's <laughs> written uproariously funny material for everyone from Bette Midler to Billy Crystal, Robin Williams, Lily Tomlin, Dolly Parton, and dozens more of your favorite stars. For decades, he's written material for every major award show, including the Oscars, the Emmys, the Tonys, and the People's Choice Awards. And he's won six Emmy Awards. He even wrote the Star Wars Holiday Special. You've seen him in many movies, including Mahogany, Breathless, and You Don't Mess With the Zohan. In the late 90s, he became a household name as everyone's favorite wisecracking celebrity panelist on Hollywood Squares. You've also seen him on the Celebrity Fit Club, Jury Duty, RuPaul's Drag Race, Child of the 70s, and dozens of documentaries and TV specials. He's written plays and song lyrics. He's been a columnist for The Advocate. He's co-authored numerous books, and he wrote his own hilarious book of essays entitled Bruce, My Adventures in the Skin Trade. He's the multi-talented comedy genius known as Bruce Valanche. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. Wow, I'm, I'm gonna go date myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I it'll be I'm good hot. for you. Holy, what an intro. God, I wish I had an opening number now. You do. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Bruce, I have to tell you that I first became a big fan of yours in 1976 when you were credited as a writer on a Bette Midler TV special. Over the years, I realized that you were the key person who helped Bette Midler create her onstage persona of the Divine Miss M. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's true. I mean, she had done it uh, and she had her her hairdresser, a, a man named Bill Hennessy, was complicit in doing this as well. And then later on, we had a collaborator named Jerry Blatt. They're both gone. Yeah. So we were all we were all there at the beginning. But I mean, you know, it was her. She discovered this side of herself, the Divine Miss M, that, that we exploited. <laughs> You wrote material for Old Red Hair is Back, Clams on the Half Shell, Divine Madness, Diva Las Vegas, Divine Intervention, The Showgirl Must Go On. What would Bette Midler have done without you? Not those shows, I guess. <laughs> she would have been fine, but because she's brilliant. She's the best there is. But obviously, something clicked. It's been going on for 50 years. Oh! Uh, and it continues to this day. We had dinner the other night. She was out here. And she's getting a Kennedy Center honor this year, which, of course, involves her sitting in a box and waving like the queen. We were just talking about ridiculous things they could do. You know, and I said, I, I want to come out there as a mermaid in a wheelchair and uh, talk about some of the things we did in the show. That won't happen. I mean, you know, they'll the, and then introduce a really big name to, to honor her. But, you know, we were just laughing about about if, if we could do it, what we, what we would do. I think that would be amazing. I hope you are part of that. Uh, are you going to be part of the show? No. No, not well, that I know of. I mean, and even if I were, I couldn't talk about it because the element of that show is they, they like to surprise the star. And I, I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the smart recipient says, oh, I love so-and-so and, -so and it would be wonderful if so-and-so appeared and all that, or I'm very friendly with it. But, or sometimes they just kind of, you know, lay back and, and say, do what you're going to do. They all do look surprised when some of the people come out. I'm never sure if it's because they're happy about them or that they're like, what? This is the best you could get? <laughs> well, but one I, of the most wonderful things you wrote for Bette Midler was for Johnny Carson's farewell show when you wrote new lyrics to the song, You Made Me Love You. You called it, You Made Me Watch You. That was so yeah. touching. That was uh, a collaboration with Mark Shaman who wrote Hairspray, uh, among other many things, and has been Beth's music director over the years. Uh, the three of us sat down at his house and came up. We, it was, of course, the next to last Johnny Carson show. And we, so we wanted to kind of come up with a, a sort of spot that she would have done on the show, which she had been on, I think, 34 times. And a lot of them at the beginning, he really gave her a big boost at the beginning. He also took her to Vegas uh, to open for him, which was not so successful because his crowd you know, they, 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 were, they wanted something a little bit squarer than that. But uh, when we, we wanted it to be like a bit that she would have done on the Carson show years ago. So we knew special, we had to do special material. So, and that, that was, you know, it worked. What can I say? She won an Emmy for it. Yes, yeah, she did. Now, Bruce, I know you were a child actor and your parents were supportive of that. And you went to Ohio State University as a theater and journalism student. At that time, what were your career aspirations? 
pretty, <laughs> I wanted to be a, a, an actor. I, I mean, I, I was a child actor. I was never a child star, or we'd be having this conversation in rehab. But I was a child actor, and I, I just always enjoyed doing that. So my, I guess my goal was to go to Broadway, and, and, and it took me like 50 years to do that. But I, the writing, I hadn't really thought about the writing. It's just that as I got older, uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was born 40, and I always was playing these parts that I was far too young for. And when I, I would audition for real things, uh, there would be age-appropriate people getting the, the parts. So... My parents said, you know, you can write about this stuff, so and you have a talent there. So they encouraged that. So I, I, I was back and forth between acting and writing. I was always doing uh, each, of the, uh, each of them at the same time. So I, I, I kind of thought, like, I'll just see where this takes me. I, I looked at people like Woody Allen and Mel Brooks, and they were writers who became performers. And they managed to do both. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll see if I can make it work that way. And so far, so good. I mean, I'm, I'm not a movie star like they are, but I didn't create movies for myself like they did. Right, so, right. There's a lesson for you. Write well, something for yourself if, you're going, if you want to act it. True enough, true enough. In 1999, you were the subject of a documentary called Get Bruce, and your mother was in that film. I love that you gave your mom credit for developing your sense of humor. What was she like? Well, she was hysterically funny. <clears throat> she was very controlling. Uh, I was an only child. I was adopted, and she had grown up. Uh, her mother died when she was eight, and her father had sent her off to schools. They had some money, and so she only saw him on holidays. And he remarried when she was 16, and his new wife decided he, she would take control. And so they, it was coffee and pistols for two for many years, but they eventually bonded. So she was determined that she would be in my life. In a very, she would never let me grow up without a, a, an active mother. And she was a hyperactive mother. But she was hysterically funny. She was charming. Everybody... I mean, the, you know, people, people gravitated towards her. She had incredible comic timing, and her family were all sort of, they weren't performers. There was one actual performer. He was a Catskills comic named Mickey Landau, who was never a big deal, but he worked. But the whole family had timing. They were, each and every one of them was a character. I mean, it was, you know, everybody says that about their families, but they really were. My father's side of the family, they were doctors and lawyers, and they were very stolid people. Nice, but you know, but my mother's side of the family was hilarious. And so I, I observed them and I stole a lot of stuff. <laughs> so your sense of comedy came from your mom and her side of the family. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. And that's Although what I have, I have recently family. found my birth mother and uh, who's now gone. But my bio family says that uh, she was hysterically funny. And I mean, she had to be. They sent me a photo of her gravestone, which says, uh, it has her name and it says, Thin at last. Oh, so, really? Yes, yeah, she had a weight problem her whole life. <laughs> I'm not, and she um, <laughs> and she was she was very funny with a sense of humor. And she was in the she was in the uh, pr commercial production business, oddly enough. So they maintain that there's a genetic disposition towards uh, comedy <laughs> in our family, in my birth family, and there was in my adopted family on my mother's side. So. Uh, I guess I got, a, I got a double vaccination. You absolutely did. So how did you go from being an entertainment writer for the Chicago Tribune to one of the most popular and successful comedy writers for every major star in Hollywood? Well, it was Bette Midler. I started writing for her when I got to Chicago. I met her in Chicago and she was uh, there. She was on Broadway and Fiddler on the Roof as one of the daughters. And she was in Chicago doing her, her nightclub act. And I wrote about her and we got friendly and I said, you should talk more on stage. And she said, you got any lines? And I began writing for her. And the word got around that I was the guy who was writing for her. And uh, part of my job on the trip was interviewing celebrities when they came through town. And these celebrities said, oh, you're the, that guy. And I would begin writing for them. So, but uh, after about five years, I was writing for Joan Rivers and Lily Tomlin and Richard Pryor and George Carlin and a lot of David Steinberg, the comedian, Bet had a dresser whose brother had started an act called Manhattan Transfer. 
and they were uh, uh, at the time in Nostalgia Act, they became a big jazz act. And uh, we put their act together and got they got a summer television series replacing <laughs> Cher for the summer. And I also had been writing for Sonny and Cher and Cher and Sonny, with Sonny, Sonny without Cher. So I came out here to L.A. to write the Manhattan Transfer TV series. And I never went back. I went back to pick up the animals, but and I, that was it. I was out here. And I, I mean, I came here. I had an agent and I had a job which is more than most people have when they come out here. And, and, and I started writing a lot of variety television until, of course, you know, cable killed variety television. And so I started, I started writing award shows because that became the new variety. The, you know, the only variety shows on TV now are competitions. Yes, exactly. That's right. Now, everybody and, uh, knows that you wrote some of the most memorable jokes and material for award shows, especially the Oscars, for many years. I know it's the biggest show in the world, but I would imagine that there's a lot of stress involved because you've got to please so many people before a joke actually gets accepted. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's the show that everybody w will remember you from. I mean, you, uh, Sally Fields said, uh, you like me, you like me, and it haunted her the rest of her life. And uh, she finally monetized it for a visa commercial. But uh, it, it never goes away. That stuff never goes away. So... Everybody's very nervous that what they're going to say will be will will echo in the corridors of time, and so they they there are eight million thought police. They have agents, they have managers, they have publicists, they have husbands, they have trainers, they have holistic pet psychiatrists, they have everybody offering an opinion. I mean, I once got a a call from Goldie Hawn's trainer saying, "Oh, she left the script at the at the uh, gym," and I looked at she won't say this. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Lars. <laughs> I'll be speaking with her later. Well, one of the funniest Oscar shows ever was the year that Billy Crystal hosted and Jack Palance won an Oscar and did one-handed push-ups on the stage. And Billy kept doing Jack Palance jokes for the rest of the night, which I understand you were feeding him. Uh, me and, and Robert Wall and David Steinberg. Uh, Robert, uh, you know Robert Wall from Archer. He was not the, the cartoon Archer, but the sports Archer. And uh, he's a very funny actor and a writer. And uh, we were the team and we were in the wings. And, and when that happened, first of all, you know, uh, it, um, Jack Pounce was in Billy's movie. Billy basically fought to get him in the picture. And so he won for that movie. So when he came out, his first line was, Billy Chris like crap bigger than him. So we thought, oh, great. We, you know, we've, the show's been on the air 25 minutes and already we're, now we're getting this. And then he started doing the push-ups. And Whoopi had presented him with the award because she'd won the year before. So she was like standing back, like step away from the vehicle, don't get any on you. And we realized this was going to be, this was a big deal. And because he had kind of thrown down, right? He'd issued a challenge. Billy felt that he had to respond. And we all felt he had to respond. So it was, you know, it was just, just jokes about Jack being, you know, macho man. And, and we just kept throwing out what we had. And every time we could, he would go out with a joke that we would come up with about things. And finally, um, uh, David Steinberg, the manager, came backstage and said, he was sitting in the audience and he said, we're having a pool. How many of these are you going to do? I want to win. And so it just kind of became a legend. And, and we won an Emmy for writing that show. And the following year, Billy hosted again. So we had Jack Palance come out dragging an Oscar statue like he was out of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I remember that. And Billy was riding the statue. And it was kind of like, he's so strong. He's Samson. That's what he is. And uh, so, you know, and it, it became one of those things. You know, it lives in legend. Now, as I said in my introduction, you've written jokes for the biggest comics. Obviously, the jokes you write have to reflect the personality of the star you're writing for. And they're all so unique. I mean, Billy Crystal's humor is nothing like Bette Midler's. How did you manage to become such a chameleon in, in your writing style? I, I don't know. I mean, you have a, a, the gift is that they already have established a persona and you can write to that. You just have to study it and pay attention to it. And I'm lucky in that I am flexible. Uh, I compare it to Bob Mackey uh, designing a dress. He would not put Cher in the same dress as he would put Lizzo. But he's a great dress designer, so he knows what's going to look good on them because he has studied their body and their style. And, you know, uh, 
playwrights and screenwriters and novelists who write fiction from scratch have to come up with all of these variations and they are not given the persona to write to. They have to create the persona themselves. Uh, so it's a much harder task, as I have discovered, when I'm actually writing any of those things. But it's, it's much more fun to, when somebody comes to you and says, you know, here's who I am. You all know who I am. And you can write. And when Shirley MacLaine, you know, who I wrote for, would, I mean, she had created the, that, that Shirley MacLaine character. At first, she was a kook and a big movie star. And then she was like the queen of booga booga and, and holistic everything and extraterrestrial everything and, and past life everything. And uh, so you could write, you knew you could write all kinds all kinds of stuff to that character, to that person and uh, material that she, only she could use. And she was willing to make fun of herself uh, use, using your material. It was really quite brilliant. And another well, one, you were very good friends with Florence Henderson and you worked with yeah. her many times, including the Brady Bunch Variety yeah. Hour, which I loved. Was Thank she you. as warm and lovely in person as she was on screen? She absolutely was, but uh, she was also a very hip, raunchy. She could really be uh, as as sophisticated and vulgar as the best of them. But she, uh, as as she, you know, she came from the Midwest and she was a Broadway uh, soprano, and she was uh, her. She started in Oklahoma, and uh, and played all of those parts, and she became known for that. And so she was kind of like, you know, clean, Julie Andrews, clean, and. Uh, and when she, uh, she had a nightclub act and all that, and then she married a guy, she married a Jewish guy who ran the Schubert Theater chain, who was part of the, uh, and they had opened the theater in LA and they wanted to move him out here. And so they moved to the coast. They had four kids. And she said, so I didn't want to go on the road and I wasn't on Broadway. So I took television. She had done a lot of Dean Martin shows and stuff and they shot for a sitcom and they got the Brady Bunch. And I don't think she ever expected, nobody ever expected the Brady Bunch would still be around 50 years later, it, that it would become as iconic as it became. But in the public's eye, she became Carol Brady. And so, of course, she didn't want to, you know, kill the golden goose. But and so she continued, she maintained that image forever. But in her private life, you know, she was flow. She was flossy. She was, uh, she was you know, the Jewish housewife, kind of. Uh, and and she was very funny and, and very hip. And, uh, and when when I after the Manhattan transfer, which was a, a critical success, but didn't do anything in the ratings, uh, I, I would go around for jobs and uh, and uh, they would all say, oh, you're too hip. Oh, you're very hip. You're too hip for what we're doing. And I said to her one day, one day, I'm what do I do? I'm too hip. because I know how you feel. And I thought, you're too hip. Florence Henderson is too hip. And then I realized, of course, what she was saying. And she said, come write the Brady Bunch. Uh, and they were doing, at the time, the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, which is a notorious television show. And uh, so I wrote on that. And that kind of cured me forever of the two hip. <laughs> I was hip enough. <laughs> so how did you end up on the Hollywood Squares, Bruce? Well, I've been around 20 years writing for everybody. And I was sort of known. And I had worked with on uh, all the comic relief shows with Pat Lee and uh, John Moffat who produced them. And they were get, they were, they rebooted Hollywood Squares and they asked me to come and be the head writer. They wanted it to be more of a comedy show than a game show. And so I took the job and I was, and then they went and got Whoopi to be Center Square. Now Whoopi and I had had a relationship for some time. And uh, so she said, I think Valance should host the show. And they thought she was crazy, but they didn't want to piss her off that early in the game. So they auditioned me and I got to do a tape. And, and this one's for the win, Louise. Uh, and that was not going to happen. So they put me in a square. And I think <laughs> they thought that I would tame her. They were worried. And of course, that wasn't going to happen because, as we, we frequently say, she's really this Jew gay Jewish guy and I'm really a black woman. Right, right. <laughs> Ask anyone who slept with me, they will tell you. But we had, we, we had this thing going, and I was, in, you know, I was, I kept saying, I'm to the left of Whoopi, which is almost impossible. You can't be to the left of Whoopi. And I was, and we, we would have this thing going on, and, and it was fun. 
And for for like six years, I was on TV almost every night. Yeah, I never missed it. On. I never uh, missed it. And the thing that uh, got me, you were often compared to Paul Lind, who was considered one of the wittiest people ever to appear on Hollywood Squares. And although he was enormously funny, <laughs> I always got the feeling that he was not a happy person and maybe even a little bitter. What did you think of he Paul? Was, uh, he was very unhappy and a lot bitter. And partially it was because uh, his talent did not lend itself to what he wanted. He was not going to become a big movie star because he was a flavor. Uh, and he didn't create his own material. Uh, and he was envious of Woody Allen and Mel Brooks, who he had come up with on Broadway in the 60s. But they created their own material. And, and he didn't. He was somebody who you brought in to play as Rock Hudson's best friend. You know, it was a Tony Randall character. But unlike Tony, he didn't have those, he, the diverse acting chops to do a lot of other stuff. He would come and he would do a line and then he would, he would leave. So when they made him the center of his own show, it didn't hold up because it, he was too negative to build a show around. And... Uh, as a result, he wound up doing Donnie and Marie, which I wrote for him on. And, and I, wrote, I wrote a lot of his stuff at Squares towards the end. Uh, and then Donnie and Marie, all of it. And I did a bunch of television specials for him. He, he, was, not a, no, he was not a happy person. And he also uh, was a raging alcoholic. And uh, on, on one drink, he was brilliant and funny. And on two drinks, he was the Nazi high command. I mean, you just didn't want to go near him. He was uh, so we always we always made sure he didn't have too much to drink. <laughs> it's a shame his image of what he wanted was yeah. so there was such a disconnect between that and who he really was as a performer. I know. I, I mean, I think if if he knew that we were talking about him forty years after he died, he would be shocked because he really thought he was a blip on the radar. He made a lot of money, and uh, he had some very loyal friends, but. Uh, he was a, uh, he was just, he was only really happy when he was performing, I thought. Uh, kind of like Letterman. Letterman is like that. Although Letterman is not, I don't think, a toxic person. Uh, but David oh, was always second guessing himself and is, is, was really happy when he was out there in the light. And, and w then the minute the light was off, he was like, oh, that was bad. That was terrible. And, and Paul was just like angry when the light went off because, there, you know, that the light, there was no more light. We got, we got along, but I learned, don't pet the panther. Keep your hand outside the panther's cage. Wow, that's so sad. And it was very obvious, at least to me, there was always a bite in that humor. Now, talking yeah. about performing, in 2005, you starred as Edna Turnblad in the Broadway production of Hairspray. And I got to see you in that production. And you were really fabulous. And I'm surprised they didn't get you to play Edna in the movie. Well, that wasn't going to happen. The movie wasn't going to happen unless they had a movie star playing Edna, because uh, they were going to go with an unknown girl uh, for for uh, Tracy, which is the lead role. So they they were it, 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 they just they shopped around to to a, a number of people, and John Travolta, much to their surprise, took it, and he came to see the show, and I was in it, and I knew John anyway from before, and he asked me what you know what I thought. And I said, look, you know, you've had the biggest flop anyone could have. It's Battleship Earth. It, it, this will not be as big a flop as that. So, you know, if it works, then you're, you're a chameleon. If it works, you're this brilliant, uh, you're, you're De Niro now. You can do anything. And it worked. It was a huge movie. And, but he changed it. I mean, he changed Edna's character a lot. He, he, she wore more makeup. He looked like Kirstie Alley. He wore so much makeup. And, uh, uh, and he gave, he said, I think she should have a waist. And I said, uh, you know, the whole idea that Wilbur, has fought, Wilbur loves her anyway. But, you know, you can't argue with the kind of success. The picture was a gigantic success. So they also changed the, the ending. So, But when they did it on television, live, they, Harvey came back because he had created the musical role. And it was fine you know, because the, no one's like Harvey. I mean, you know, he's the best. But I had a great time doing it. I mean, I, I did it for two years. I toured for a year, and then I did Broadway for. Did you see it in New York? 
I saw it in New York on Broadway and I waited outside the stage door and you signed okay. my program. Thank oh, you. Baby. Yeah, I was very, I was very magnanimous. I was you I truly know. were. I now, um, I want to throw some names at you and I would love you to tell me something about your experiences working with them. Donnie and Marie Osmond. Well, Paul was on that show. I wrote a lot for Paul and uh, they were very young. I mean, Marie turned 18 in the course of the, of the show. And so there was, you know, it was the Book of Mormon. I mean, they were, they were literally the Book of Mormon. There was a list of things you could not have them do because they were, you know, it, it was a Mormon show. It was written by Jews because of variety of television. So they brought in all the Jews and a lot of gay people. So there I was, gay Jew in, in Mormon, Ruth in the alien corn. I was surrounded by them. And, uh, and there were many, we couldn't, we couldn't have a coffee break. You couldn't refer to a coffee break. We would, did not take coffee breaks in the studio. There was a whole list of that kind of stuff. So it was a constant. And it was the one show I worked on where we didn't have any trouble with the network censor because the, the Mormon elders had gotten to everything before the network could possibly give a note. Well, almost everything. I understand you considered it a personal triumph when you got Marie Osmond to sing Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me? Yes, I did, because it, there have been several different songs submitted, and they found fault with everything. And that one, for some reason, they loved. I mean, they were fans of Elton John, I think. But there she was, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. And I was in the booth with the network censor, looked at me and said, I see what you did here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Robin Williams. Well, brilliant, fast, funny, and, and a, a sweetheart, one of, the, one of the, the kindest, nicest, gentlest people, who was you know, tormented by many things. I mean, he, he had a, a, a bad drug history, and then he had a, a, a depression, and we had no idea that he had contracted this particular condition, this rare condition that causes suicidal uh, tendencies, and that uh, is, is, is kind of, you know, deep depression beyond uh, the, uh, your, your standard your garden variety depression. So uh, it was, uh, I, I, we, he had been cut off from so many of us uh, in, in the, 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 the last marriage that, uh, which I think he probably did because something told him that it was a good idea to, to like be, have a whole new life. It, that, uh, uh, it was off, it was awful how it ended, but he, he was incredible fun to work with and uh, inspiring. And you know, uh, people would say, "Oh, so, you write for him? He's so spontaneous." I said, "Yes, he's spontaneous the first time, and like everybody else, if something works, then you incorporate into what you're doing and you embroider when you're working before a live audience." So there was a lot of that. But he was, I would say, he was. He always had demons, but he was not a troubled person in the sense of he wasn't difficult. He was always sort of, he was always fun. And a lot of it was, uh, you know, he wanted it to be fun. But, uh, but uh, I think he genuinely was fun. Yeah, I really miss him. What about Dolly Parton? Well, I'm working with her right now, actually. We came up with a little idea for a musical. And we're, she uh, is licensing her music to us. Uh, so she's a partner now. Now, I was one of the Jews who was brought in to fix the Dolly Parton show, which was a gigantic series on ABC in the 80s that opened very strong but fizzled out. And they oh, just, I loved it. I never understood why it fizzled out. I loved that show. Well, I think a couple of reasons. I mean, she had lost a great deal of weight and she was she she was a player now. I mean, she looked you know, very sexy. She didn't look quite as cuddly as she had. And I think it turned some people off. And I think she was not Carol Burnett and wasn't adaptable to a lot of sketches. She has such a strong persona as Dolly Parton that she can't just become somebody else. And in her movie career, she's always played the, a Dolly Parton character. Yeah, she's not an actress. She's a personality. Right. But when you're putting together one of those variety shows where you have guest stars and supporting people and all that, she, she wasn't really the, the linchpin of the center of something because anybody you put next to her, she was always still Dolly. So it was, it was uh, you had to tread very carefully. And I think people just got tired of, of looking at that. It wasn't working. And so uh, when they 
when they got rid of the first batch of Jews and they said, okay, let's bring in fresh Jews, like the Pony Express, fresh <laughs> horses. So in we trotted, Jews with typewriters. And we started and we, we finally said, we got rid of all of those elements that made it look like, made it look like Cher and said, let's, every show should be an event. So it was Dolly goes to Hawaii, Dolly goes, opens Dolly with Dolly at the Metropolitan Opera, uh, Dolly in London. And, uh, and the, the numbers crept back up, but it was a very expensive show and, and they, they, they could not make back what they were spending and they, were, they got tired of deficit financing it. So they canceled it and paid her off. That was cheaper than continuing to, to uh, crank it out. I think she's the most likable person in show business. Oh, yeah. Well, she's a Now she's, you know, curing cancer. I mean, she's she's gave all her Whitney Houston money to black colleges. She does a vaccination campaign on television. I mean, she is she's very busy doing good work now. I mean, visibly, she always was, but now she's doing it visibly. So, you know, she has kind of become the heart and soul of the nation. <laughs> what about Barry Manilow? Well, he was Beth's piano player when I met him. He he had. He was a rehearsal pianist, but he was Juilliard educated, and he, he had a very big career in jingles. He wrote, you deserve a break today. And, from, and he played and he sang. So he, had, he had a lot of income, a lot of passive income. And he, was, he substituted for her regular piano player her first night at the, at the Turkish Bath, at the Continental Bath. And he signed on and said, I want to be your music director. And it was clear he was brilliant. He constructed her show musically and theatrically, and it was part of the initial team. And then, of course, he got a record deal on his own and went out. And he expected he would be Johnny Mathis, that he would do love songs and uh, he would have a nice career. But after Mandy, suddenly he became a teen idol. And he was very unaccustomed to this part, and it took him a long time to get comfortable. But then he had a string of gigantic hits and became a tremendous performing artist. And I wrote his first TV special, the Barry Manilow special. And then, you know, he was so busy working, he had to have somebody who was, who was his exclusively. So I would job in over the years. And we stayed friends the whole time. And he's, he's a terrific guy. I mean, he really is. And the best part is he finally came out. He got married. He married his, his husband of, you know, 40 years. And, and the fan base is still there. Those women love him. They may be always new, but they just didn't admit it. But, you know, uh, he had to stay closeted because he sang love songs. You know, he wasn't like Casey and the Sunshine Band singing Shake Your Booty. He was doing basically love songs and the occasional Copacabana. And they want to know who you're singing to. So it's difficult. It was difficult in those days to say, well, here's the guy I'm singing to. When Elton tried that, they banned him. He was knocked off a lot of radio stations. Right. But he right. dared to say in the early 70s that he was bisexual. He had to get married. He had to go marry a woman right away because all of those uh, stations, the radio stations in those days that were run locally, uh, in all the markets where the church meant something, they, those, those guys would just say it's easier to, to not play him than to take on the local church people. And this is like this. I, when I say this now, I say, wow, this sounds ancient. And it is. It's the early 70s, but it's, it is the way it was. I mean, now there isn't even a radio business the way there was. There's no payola now. I mean, because, you know, you go on Spotify, you go on Pandora. I mean, this is how you sell music these days. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for Barry Manilow because it's clear that he had to navigate a very difficult persona given the material he was doing. And he's a wonderful person. What about Elizabeth Taylor? Did you ever get to know her well? Yeah, <clears throat> well, through uh, AIDS, after, after Rock Hudson, she committed herself to, to AIDS fundraising and to being the, the basic spokesperson. And without her in this country and uh, Princess Diana in the UK, there would be no AIDS fundraising operation. Because uh, and I used to joke with her, any, anybody would take her call. I mean, even the Pope would take her call, if only to discuss jewelry. Because <laughs> you know, the Pope has a lot of it, and, uh, and so does she. But she, it, it only happened because of her. And I think that partially it was at that point in her life, 
I think she was kind of looking inward and and saying, how could I be a better person? And I know this sounds ridiculous, but... No, it know, doesn't. She was, but she was, a, uh, you know, she was a child star. And so the whole world revolved around her in a big way from the time she was little. And I think that she finally said, uh, uh, you know, I have something now that I can do, I can give back. Because aside from her AIDS work, her her principal passion were her, her children and grandchildren, which no one thinks of Elizabeth in those terms, but they were at you the know, forefront of her life. And, uh, and of course, you know, she had lifelong health issues and uh, she had substance abuse issues that stemmed from an accident she had on a horse during National Velvet and she was on painkillers and she developed an addiction and this, this went through back and forth her whole life and you know everything that she do, did was done under uh, uh, paparazzi and you know lighting she had a unique existence very i mean she was you know, crazy and and it, it took her forever to get ready for anything and you know she was conscious of the fact that she had to be elizabeth taylor when she walked out the door and no matter what shape she was really in so she developed this reputation, but, but I found her to be really professional and, and down to earth and not a diva, believe it or not. No, that's why I asked you, I, I, I wanted uh, to hear you say that because the people that knew her say that. And another one, Diana Ross. Now you played the dress manufacturer in Mahogany. Tell us yeah. a little bit about Diana Ross. Well, you know, I, I met her on that, and I was, I was in Chicago being a writer, and I knew the director was originally Tony Richardson, and then Barry Gordy took over and directed it, and moved it from Chicago to Rome, because Rome's more photogenic than the south side of Chicago. And I met her, and it was, you know, she was like deglamorized, and, and she was playing a, the part, uh, the part of the movie that we were, I was in was before she becomes the famous model Mahogany. And so she was very dressed down all the, and, uh, all the time. And um, we shot more scenes that didn't make it into the picture. But one day she had to go do a, a benefit in Chicago. And we, we wrapped early and she went into the trailer and she came out uh, an hour later and I was still there chatting with people. And the trailer door opened and Diana Ross walked out, you know, with the, with the eyelashes that birds could nest in and the hair and the jewelry and the makeup and the glitter and the whole, she was Diana Ross. And I thought, who are you? You know, who is this kid who I just worked with all day? That can't be the same. And, and she kind of looked at me and she said, yeah, this is it. <laughs> and, you know, it was an early lesson in, uh, in, you know, you create this thing and you, you bring it out of the closet when you work and then it goes back in afterwards. That's actually very healthy. Uh, you know, I think, but I mean, me, uh, Marilyn Monroe was famous for being in camouflage, and occasionally she would say, "Do you want? Do you want to see her?" And she would take off the glasses and the babushka, and she would become Marilyn. And of course, the world would flock. But I suppose I didn't know her, but I suppose in in, in that instance, from what I understand, she wanted that. You know that she did have that need. So uh, I don't know that uh, uh, that that Diane has that need because. You know, she came out of the projects and it was all about the work and and taking care of family. And she's still taking care of her family. She uh, is. Yeah. So, uh, um, well, not Tracy. No, Tracy's she's done, done just great. fine. Tracy's done great. But I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, a big family, there's a lot of people. And no. uh, well, like, Dolly, you know, Dolly opened a theme park to put all of her relatives on payroll. Gloria and Emilio Estefan have six restaurants in Miami because they have such a huge family and they're all working for them. My God, I'm glad I don't have kids. I, you know, it's just me. And now I have this new birth family. I hope they don't want me to give them jobs. They're actually, they're all fine. They're all well-established people. So, I think it's really lovely that you reconnected with your birth family. I'm, I'm happy for you. It's, yeah, it's, a whole, it's something I really never expected. I expected that... Uh, I, I had written them all. I, fi I figured, you know, they're gone. But then, you know, like everybody else, you spit in a cup just to see what happens, and this is what happened. Now that you, now there's DNA, and now there's ancestry, and 23andMe, and all these things that you can do. And you, 
actually find people who so, wish to be found. I'd like to point that out. That's uh, that could you you find people who have also spit into a cup and who are interested. It's not just you know you suddenly voice yourself. <laughs> no, no, it's a mutual thing. Now, yeah. when I was doing my research for this interview, I read that you refused to write material for Barbara Streisand because she wouldn't pay you enough. Is that true? No, I, I wrote for her for free. And then when she wanted to hire me, <laughs> she made a very low ball offer. And, uh, and I said, no, and I jokingly said, sell a lamp, because she was selling all furniture from her house because she was building a new house. And- uh, You really uh, said that? Yeah. And uh, it's and they quote it was in the story went into the movie and the movie came out get uh, get Bruce came out and she was there was a series of stories in the media about how cheap she is and they were kind of like pillorying her for various things she'd done and it was in among those and so she decided to be mad at me and she was mad at me for many years and then finally we sort of made up. But I haven't really had any, any contact with her in a long time. I kept running into her at Oscar shows and things like that, things that benefits that we were both on. But you know, she she just she she you know she resented. Uh, she she said I made it up, which was it was documented, and uh, uh, and that was her defense. And then she realized that she didn't have a defense, and so she just kind of avoided it. I don't know if it's, if it's it, it may still be on her website. She has a thing on her website, a truth alert, uh, with all her, her response to every charge made against her ever. Yes, uh, I've read it a few times. Now, Bruce, as you know, we're living in a world of political correctness where people are so easily offended these days. I mean, I can't even imagine how somebody like Don Rickles would have a career today. Do you feel constrained in your writing because of political correctness? Oh, absolutely. I mean, every, I mean, it's ridiculous now, but I think that it's, it's turning a corner very slowly. I think there is a, a, a reaction to wokeness that, that's happening that, that, you know, there's such a thing as free speech, there's such a thing as due process. Uh, and these things are being trampled on uh, by people who are eager. I mean, it's either they have, they have a revenge scenario going or they, uh, they are, they're keyboard warriors, a lot of them, who are just, you know, sitting in their mother's basement, pounding away. And, uh, but it makes it very difficult. Yeah, it's full of landmines. Cause you, and I think that you, you probably just, you know you're gonna get some kind of reaction, you're gonna offend somebody. But I think we've always known that. It's just that the, the parameters have shrunk of stuff that, that somebody won't find offensive. And, you know, I'm a member of several minorities. I'm gay and I'm Jewish. And so when I see gay jokes or Jew jokes, I kind of go, hmm, well. But, it, but it's, I, I'm, my, my bench is not to cancel somebody. My bench is not to prevent them from working because they made a joke or they have an opinion. I mean, I may not want to work with them personally myself, but I don't believe that they should be canceled. I mean, I don't believe in... And the other, and and the, the proof that it's not a good idea is that the right wing has seized onto it, like Kathy that, Griffin. Well, yeah, but but I'm and more recently than that, they are actually using the idea of cancel culture, that that the left is all cancel culture, and that shows you what a bad idea cancel culture really is. Yeah, and, you know, Kathy had, I thought, a bizarre reaction to what happened to her. I, I was surprised because she's str stronger than that. I, I thought she would, like, fight back, but she just kind of, she caved. And I don't know why. But now, you know, her life has become very complicated. You know, I, I, want, I was always in her camp. So, uh, I mean, what she did was, it was just a bad joke. It was, you know. It was seized upon by the right wing to, uh, and she was an early victim of it. But I, I also don't, I, I never thought she used what was at her disposal to, to go, to come back. I don't know what, what was happening with her, so. Now, Bruce, I see you as an artist, you're a creative, but you're living in a bubble in Hollywood where everything is about money, ratings, numbers. I get the feeling that show business is much more about the business than the show. How do you keep yourself <laughs> motivated as an artist in that kind of an environment? 
Uh, that's interesting. It's an interesting question. And it, 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 you know, pos- I mean, I posit the question, am I an artist? Or I am, uh, am I just doing a job? Am I, I'm, I'm doing what I like, uh, and it's fun. And I roll with the punches, I guess. And I, I have to confess that I am, having been a journalist, I am kind of, I'm amused by the emphasis on the business side of show business. But that kind of goes with everything because people are interested in money. And money has become a big thing because uh, I mean, money always was a big thing. But the idea that uh, what people who never had access to money have access to money and what they do with it now. I mean, you know, you look at, uh, at a show like TMZ, which was about stars getting out of cars. And now everybody on it is from reality TV. They're a real housewife or they're a hip hop star or something. They are from minorities that never got represented in the 1%. So uh, it's, it's kind of changed the whole perception of everything. And Warren Beatty, very years ago, Warren Beatty pointed out that it was a mistake for the, the mainstream media to pick up box office grosses and that the Wall Street Journal would run the box office grosses of the weekend every Monday because it made every movie seem like a horse race. Like if you weren't in first position, you were a flop. And, you know, it's like, and, and, then the internet came in with the creation of buzz because there were so many ways now to create buzz. I mean, uh, the movie of Dear Evan Hansen opened at the Toronto Film Festival the other night and was bombed. It was completely pilloried by, by every critic. So that's bad buzz. Now, the buzz on the internet is it's, it's cats too. Oh, yeah. You know, so they're going to have to combat that when it goes into commercial release, because that that's kind of overpowering, especially a picture like Dear Evan Hansen, which I, I don't know if you know Dear Evan Hansen. Yeah, it was a Broadway it's, show, of course. It's a Broadway show, but it's about a teenager coming to grips. I believe he's a psychopath myself, but it's about a teenager coming to grips with the internet. And here's the internet saying, this show sucks. This movie is terrible. So it'll be interesting to see how it rebounds from that. And just by having this conversation, we are adding to the buzz. Yeah. So it has changed a lot, but you know, it's, it's kind of like you know, anything else. Uh, things evolve and you learn to live with them or you, you adapt or die. I mean, it, it's as, as simple as that, you know. I'm told that when aspiring actors or writers ask you for advice about how to break into show business, you tell them don't come to Hollywood unless you have a job and an agent. Is that right? As I mentioned earlier, I had a job and an agent, yeah. But how were they supposed to get a job and an agent before even coming to Hollywood? Well, it used to be very difficult. Now you go on YouTube and you have a job and an agent and a, a press agent. And I mean, they are a proctologist. Everybody shows up at your door because you're on YouTube. You know, you have, oh, I had three million hits. Okay, here's a house in Malibu. I mean, it's fucking simple now. <laughs> it was hard when I was a girl. Now, talking about that, you've always been an out gay man in Hollywood. Have you suffered from homophobia in the industry? Probably, but I was unaware of it because I determined I was, I was going to be out. I also I felt that anybody who didn't want to hire me because they were homophobic, I didn't want to work for. Them. So it, it was, uh, and, and fortunately, there were a lot of other people who uh, didn't have that view. So uh, I got hired. But it was, I never hit anything, and I always made it a point to, to be as much of a, a male chauvinist pig about men as, I, as they were about women. And that seemed to ease their pain. They thought, geez, you know, he talks about guys' dicks the way we talk about tits. So, obviously, we're all men. And then, of course, I had to adapt to women. Well, I was always adapted to women, because I love women, and, and I got that sensibility. And the campaign became to make everybody better, better at who, who they were than, than that. But, but I, it, it just, I continued to be who I, who I was and to, uh, to be sensitive to everybody. And um, after the initial forage of, you know, like I was on Howard Stern and Howard, Howard would have, every time Howard would have me on, he would say, I can't believe how you talk about these guys. I said, Howard, it's just the way you talk about girls. This, there's no, there's no, and you get pigs. away with Howard. it. Men are pigs. And you get away with it. 
Well, you know, I mean, he's not going to try and top me. I mean, you know, I mean, he would, but. Uh, I'd help him if he does. Yeah, no, it just, it, it wouldn't matter, basically, because let's say we play on different teams. <laughs> well, one of the things I admire so much about you, Bruce, is that you've been an incredible role model and advocate for the gay community. You wrote columns for The Advocate. You've written essays on the lack of gay representation in movies. You've been nominated for a Lambda Literary Award. You've won numerous awards from GLAAD, the Shanty Foundation, the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Center, Outfest, the Los Angeles AIDS Project. I hope you realize, Bruce, I'm being very serious here. I hope you realize how beloved and respected you are by our community for the work you've done. Well, yes, I do. I mean, I've been, I've been the Marsha, Marsha, Marsha of a whole lot of gay pride parades. And, uh, and, you know, I meet people out there and I feel it. I mean, I know it's a, it's, it's a great thing. I mean, you know, when you, when you grow up Jewish, you're taught that not everybody loves you. A lot of people hate you and no one's going to help you. And so we have to do it for yourself. And I always thought that was a good mantra for the gay community. Uh, a lot of people don't like us. A lot, nobody's going to help us and we have to do it for ourselves. And so I've applied that lesson to uh, the other work we have to, and of course, the, the best, the, the, the most potent weapon we have in our arsenal is visibility. As long as we are out there saying, hey, we're gay, you know, you're going to have to deal with this. We ain't going away. Then they, they deal with it. And we put, a, we put a, a human face on it because it's very easy to hate in the abstract. But when you, when you know somebody, you, you kind of, you, you go, well, I, I like this guy. This can't. They all can't be like this. I mean, they all can't be bad. Or it it, it brings it home personally. You know, it's, it's uh, the oldest story, one of the there's, oldest stories. Th there's still a lot of actors in Hollywood who are gay but won't come out. Well, I think they are. It's down to as as, as always been down to romantic leads and action heroes. Right. I mean, the, at, at, in casting offices, the age-old question is, can he kiss the girl? Will he kiss the girl? Will the audience believe he wants to kiss the girl? Uh, if you tell the audience too much about his personal life, uh, will they still buy that he can kiss the girl? And that's, that conversation still goes on. But then you have Luke Evans, who is, is a movie star and, and has not, I mean, he's not, the reason a big picture gets made, but he has been an element in many big pictures. He's out. He has a series of spectacular Italian boyfriends, Brazilian boyfriends. And so he's there. I mean, he could be James Bond. He could be, uh, you know, run an action franchise. All these things are possible. But that's kind of like the last holdout. And it, and it parallels baseball, football, hockey, basketball, where where there are closeted gay players because they fear the reprisals. Uh, and, and of course the reprisals will come from mouth breathers. And uh, what the last 10 years have shown us is that there are a lot of mouth breathers out there. And it's a constant struggle to, to us versus the mouth breathers. It's rough. Oh yeah, that's for sure. Bruce, a lot of people may not know that you're also a playwright. You wrote the book for Platinum, which was a Broadway show from 1978. And in 2000, you wrote and performed a one-man show off-Broadway called Bruce Valanche, Almost Famous. Do you think you'll write more plays? Well, yeah, I've actually just written one. I wrote one during quarantine. Well, I wrote the thing with Dolly, and then I wrote another one during quarantine about, uh, about doing the Oscar show. And uh, I think uh, uh, we're going to do a re you know, COVID shut down everything. So now that things are beginning to come back to life, I I'm going to do a reading of it. But let's see where it goes. Well, that's exciting. Are, are you at that stage of your life where you can pick and choose what projects you get involved in? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like mean, that. I always was. I, I mean, I always was in that I, I never lived particularly high. I and mean, I was high a lot while but I never lived particularly high and so uh, as long as I was making a living you know I, I, I mean I took some things just because they were you know the, the money was there and uh, and it was uh, you know I, I didn't I didn't feel I, I mean I, I knew it wasn't the most wonderful project but the money was there and I and 
I would I would find something in it that would interest me. But uh, yeah, are there stars that you haven't worked with yet that you'd like to? Well, they're they're younger ones. Off the top of my head, I can't I can't think of anybody. I mean, uh, if they came along, it would be it would be fun to work with. I mean, I think Gaga's terrific, and it would be fun to do something with her. And I, I've done a couple of tiny things with her, but uh, um, that would be fun. But nobody like you know springs to mind as somebody. Oh, I've got to, I've just, I've got to work with Beanie Feldstein. Beanie Feldstein is wonderful. She was in Hello Dolly with Bet on Broadway, and I'm, I'm delighted to see that she's, you know, she's bursting forth. Uh, uh, as a star in her own right, and she's going to do Funny Girl on Broadway, so so she'd be fun to work with. But I've learned not to think that way because I mean I always wanted to work with Eddie Izzard, and he and now he's really becoming a woman or not really becoming. I can't I can't see what's happening with him. So, but that never happened. But hey, so my last question: you you wrote a fabulous book uh, that I'm showing on my screen. <laughs> Will you ever write a real memoir? I don't know if I've ever read a real memoir. I'm writing one now, that's, but it's basically about how I wrote the worst television shows in history and lived. <laughs> no, but I, I mean a real memoir. I think I that's mean, a more interesting way in than writing a real a memoir because everybody's writing memoirs. I know, but your life was actually quite amazing, uh, not only because you're gay and Jewish, but because you worked with the most amazing people. You are adopted you came to Hollywood with a job already, mm -hmm. and you've really seen the evolution of comedy from what, the 60s all the way up? Uh, I guess I have, yes. I mean, I was writing about them as a TV critic for the Chicago Tribune uh, in the 70s, but uh, before I came to Hollywood. But okay, maybe I'll do it. If you do that memoir, will you promise to come back on our show, Bruce? Of course. I'll call you for a Canadian publishing deal. What are you, crazy? And I will get you one. Bruce, Thanks. I've loved every moment of our time together. I tell you Justin Trudeau I'll do his Vegas act if he, uh, if he oh. doesn't win. If this election that goes south for him. I've got to tell you, I've enjoyed every minute of our time together. You've brought so much joy and laughter to millions of people for over 40 years, Bruce. And you've oh, baby. A jam-packed career. It was a real honor to have you on our show. Thanks. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so, so much, Bruce. My pleasure. Have a good time. Our, oh, guest, has, our <laughs> guest has been comedy genius Bruce Valanche. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thanks to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for watching. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.